This video goes over the questions of the day for week five. Number one is a basic two-step equation, but instead of solving for x, we're solving for x plus four. I think most people will probably subtract eight, divide by two to get four, and then substitute that in, four plus four to get eight. However, just to make an observation, if you look at x plus four compared to two x plus eight, we can just double that or divide it by two. So what happens if we divide each one of these terms by two? We get x plus four equals eight. Same answer, one step. The next one, x plus y equals 75. The equation above relates the number of minutes, x, that Maria spends running each day, and the number of minutes, y, she spends biking each day. So we have x for running and y for biking. In the equation, what does the number 75 represent? Well, A and B we can cross out because those are just the values for X and Y. And D here is a little bit unnecessarily complicated. What we're actually looking at is the sum of these two things put together, or the total. C is the best choice. Number three, which of the following is equivalent to three times the quantity X plus five minus six? So if your instinct is to distribute immediately, it's not a bad instinct. And you can probably notice that there's some like terms to combine here, the numbers. And you don't actually get an answer here, you just simplify that expression and you get 3x plus 9. Number four, a similar type of problem. We are just expanding this quadratic, or factoring this quadratic, I should say, to figure out which ones are equal. Now we could try all kinds of different methods. We might complete the square here and go from there. But it's probably just as easy to start from the answer choices. If I can figure out what x plus 3 squared and x minus 3 squared are, that'll really help me narrow things down. Now personally, I like to use the box method for these. This would give me x squared plus 6x plus 9 when I combine these two boxes. And down here in red, I would get minus 6x plus 9. So looking at this middle term, it has to be either A or B, because I want positive for 6. So the only thing left to do is to take a look at this 9 and figure out how, to, how do I get to that 4. And it turns out by subtracting 5, I'll get there, b. Number 5, this expression where x is greater than 1 and y is greater than 1 is equivalent to which of the following? So while it might be tempting to try to use the quotient rule to get rid of the fractions entirely, the real goal here seems to be to cancel out the fractions and the negatives. So let's replace those one at a time. I know here and here, I can just replace this with the second root of y, which is, usually we don't write the two, it's just the square root. And down here, this can be replaced with the third root of x. So that leaves the negatives. And actually, all I have to do when I have negative exponents is just put them on the top or the bottom, flip them from where they're at. So this x to the negative two goes down to the bottom as x squared. And this y to the negative one goes up to the top as y to the first. If I clean things up and rewrite it a little bit, I'm left with y times the square root of y over x squared times the cube root of x, which is just d. So all we did was rewrite the fractions as roots and put the negatives to the opposite part of the fraction. If it was on top, it went to the bottom. If it was on bottom, it went to the top. For number six, you could take a long division approach to this. Say, for example, we were dividing 56 by three. You could ask yourself, how many times does three go into five? One. Three times one is three. We subtract, we have two. Carry down to six. How many times does three go into 26? Eight. Eight times three is 24. Subtract, we have two. So this is a remainder, remainder two. And in fact, it's third, so two thirds. So setting things up the same way, we might ask ourselves, how many times does x minus three go into this? Well, let's look at our lead coefficients. How many times does x go into x squared? x times. And if we take x minus three times x, we get x squared minus three x. We're gonna subtract this straight down. So I'm gonna put a subtraction and a parentheses. So zero x squared, and then negative two plus three will leave me with one x, and I'll bring down the minus five. How many times does x minus three go into this? Well, it turns out to be one time. And if I subtract this, my x's go away, and I'm left with negative two. So my remainder is gonna be negative two all over x minus 
3, which gives me my answer of D. Number 7 is primarily about function notation. We often look at these functions as y equals something rather than f of x equals. But when they ask what is f of negative 1, that's my input. So I'm actually going to plug in negative 1 for x. So I can replace every x with a negative 1. And I can do some simplification here. Negative 1 squared becomes 1. If I multiply negative 6 times negative 1, that comes out as a positive 6. On the bottom, if I take negative 1 minus 1, I get negative 2. If I combine my numbers on the top, I get 10. And if I simplify here, I get negative 5. Number 8 is a typical difference of squares problem with a little bit of a wrinkle. So normally if we see a quadratic that is missing a b value and the c value is a perfect square factor like 25, we take the square root of that and do plus and minus. And then if we were to expand those, the plus 5x and the minus 5x cancel each other out, and that's a difference of squares. So one obstacle is that 2 is not a perfect square. And we also see this 1 third here. So remember that can be rewritten as is pretty much an equal sign. So if I write it out like this, I might decide to multiply both sides by 3. And here on the left, that 1 third is going to cancel out, and that 1 third here is going to cancel out. And if I rewrite things, I have to remember to distribute to my negative 2 also. So here, is 6 a perfect square? Still no. But we can always figure out what number times itself will equal 6 just by adding a square root sign. It just doesn't happen to be rational here. Which leads us to answer choice D, because that represents the value of K. For number 9, I'm going to go ahead and plot these points. There's 1, 4, and 2, 0. And we're told that the line crosses the y-axis at the point 0, b. What is the value of b? So the, if this was me, I would probably count up 1, 2, 3, 4, and over 1. So up 4 and over 1, and just repeat that pattern. And go up 1, 2, 3, 4, and over 1 again. And that's my next point, which is going to be my v-value. So here, b is going to be 8. Because once you figure out that rise over run pattern, it just repeats over and over and over again. But maybe you didn't take the graphic route. Maybe instead you use these two points in a slope formula and figure out that the slope is negative 4. Then, given a slope and pick one of the points, let's say we picked 1, 4, we can plug these into y equals mx plus b. We plug in the 4 for the y, the 1 for the x, and the negative 4 for the m, and then we solve for b. We simplify, we add, and we get our answer. Same thing, either method, 8. Number 10 gives us a polynomial with lots of uh, variables for coefficients, and they tell us some of the roots. So if an equation has these roots, that means if you plug in those values, you get 0. So if my root is negative 1, my factor is x plus 1, because if I plug in a negative 1 there, I get 0. If my root is negative 3, my factor is x plus 3. Because if I plug in that negative 3, it gives me 0. And the last factor there is going to be x minus 5. Because if I plug in a 5, it gives me 0. So they want to know which one of these, which one of the following is a factor. B is the only one on this list. If you understood what they're asking, it's really just taking the inverse of negative 1, the inverse of negative 3, and the inverse of positive 5, and those are your answers pretty quick.